Well, grace and peace to all of you and greetings from your siblings in Alabama. It's an honor to be here, Bishop. Um, your Bishop has been a great friend to me in the House of Bishops and other places, and I admire his ministry with you, and I admire your ministry. We always try to learn from each other and to encourage each other. And it's been a real, real pleasure. I brought you a story. A minister dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates. Ahead of him is a guy dressed in sunglasses, a very loud shirt, a leather jacket, and jeans. And St. Peter addresses this guy, who are you so that I may know whether or not to admit you to the kingdom of heaven? And the guy answers, I am Joe da Vinci, taxi driver of New York. St. Peter consults his list. He smiles at Joe and says, take this silken robe and golden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. The taxi driver goes into heaven with his nice robe and staff and now it is the minister's turn. The minister says, I am James Jones, pastor of St. Mary's for 45 years. St. Peter consults his list. He says to the minister, take this cotton robe and wooden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute, says the minister. That man was a taxi driver and he gets a silk robe and a golden staff. How can that be? St. Peter says, up here we work by results. While you were preaching, people slept. While he was driving, people prayed. <laughs> Now that is a joke that Bishop Bill Stow, God rest his soul, told me just before a service started at the parish where I did my field work during seminary. I was left in charge that particular Sunday and I was supposed to make everything go well and worship was gonna be great. Those were my instructions. Everything was going well until our lead musician decided not to come not to call, not to tell us he was coming. The closer we got to start time, the bigger the arriving crowd, the more anxious I got. How can we start without music? Bishop Stow saw my anxiety and he started telling me jokes to lighten the mood. Finally, he said, who cares? Really, we can walk in without music. The musician finally got there right before the gospel, so all was well. But you see, really, all was well anyway. I was all worried about my performance and the bishop was worried about my spirit. This same bishop confirmed me 45 years ago and became one of my main encouragers after I was ordained. He wanted my first priestly blessing he was never too busy for a phone call or for lunch. He taught me funny and wise sayings that I use today. First, keep a sense of humor. Pick the ditch you want to die in carefully. It's not our church, it's God's church. Allow the mercy of God to make us merciful people. And my favorite, when you get to the pearly gates, St. Peter will ask you two things. Did you have fun? And how well did you love? In his last sermon to the diocesan convention, he sounds a lot like Paul. I am a Christian, he writes, because of Jesus Christ. I find him unforgettable. I didn't have a sudden conversion slowly over time. Scripture showed me Jesus. He is the main theme. He's always in the back of my mind. He fell in love with Jesus and became a fisher of people. His presence and love reminded me in my ministry, I was never alone. Well, who are your heroes? Maybe my recalling one of mine helps you remember yours. Today we stand on the brink of an extraordinary spiritual blessing. 
namely the reaffirming of the ontological shift that begins with baptism and confirmation and in a mighty way continues that ordination when God sends the Holy Spirit to touch, empower, and possess us, making us priests and deacons in God's holy church. As we renew our original vows, we'll rehearse again the staggering job description in the vows. If you're like me, every time I hear them, I discover the many promises that I've forgotten or neglected lately. I got some work to do. But don't let that get in the way of the gratitude for the gift of our shared common life. Our promises are weighty and rich and impossible. But like St. Paul says, not many of us are wise by human standards. Not many are powerful and not many are of noble birth. But God's grace through Jesus always equips us and never disappoints. God chooses what is weak and foolish to shame the wise and the strong so that we may only boast in the Lord Jesus. And in our gospel, we hear what Jesus says about his own death in John's gospel. Just hours away from the cross, the Greeks come saying, we wish to see Jesus. And he knows his hour has arrived. Everything was leading him here. It was what Jesus worked, hoped, and waited for. And he doesn't answer the Greeks directly because he's got other things to do. Now that he knows his glory is near, honestly, he says, now my soul is troubled. Jesus has some doubts. You know, I imagine Bonhoeffer's soul was troubled when he decided to plot to assassinate Hitler. And when he was killed two days before his liberation, he prayed for his executioners. Mother Teresa's secret letters say she spent years tormented by doubt, continuing to love and serve the poor anyway. She hoped God would redeem her suffering. Now, I've never had to risk my life for my faith yet. And when it comes to devotion and trust, I am no Mother Teresa. But I've noticed doubt and faith always go together. My friend Bishop Stow liked to say, God reserves the ordained ministry for the really, really hard cases. <laughs> Jesus always shows up faithfully doing for me what I cannot do for myself. Sometimes, too, when I give up and trust God, I feel a deep peace. But turning my life, my worries, or someone I love over to God is sometimes very scary. Letting go and letting God can feel like a little death. Mystic Richard Rohr says, all great spirituality is about letting go or what we, of what we think we are or need to be and it always feels like dying. If you have always lived out of your independent ego, it will feel like you are losing everything. Well, I heard about a man who goes to the psychiatrist complaining that his brother-in-law, who lives with him, thinks he is a chicken. What are his symptoms, the doctor asks. Well, he cackles, pecks at the rug, and makes a nest in the corner. The doctor says, sounds like a simple neurosis. Bring him to me and I will cure him. The man says, oh no, we wouldn't want that. We need the eggs. <laughs> you see, there's a child in me that seems to like the delusion that I am in charge of my life and my death. But Jesus' troubled soul tells me he knows that delusion and he knows how I feel. He decided on self-offering, where he could love something more than his life, where he would suffer, not his goal, by the way, but as a byproduct of his choice. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot grow, is how Jesus puts it. He chooses to be who God created him to be, no matter the cost, 
and this is also what I hope for myself and all of us. When we renew our vows, whether ordained or lay, I believe the Holy Spirit pulls us even deeper into the mystery of following Christ and gives us the courage to do what he asks of us. With our staggering job description, extraordinary claims, the pay in dollars will never be enough. The return in dividends is priceless. The truth is, in the adventure, which is following Christ, I seem closer to truth and light when I'm lost in search of God and trusting that grace will come. I'm closer to truth and light when I wonder. Someone said to wonder is to be still, open-handed, open-eyed, open-hearted, ready to receive what is more and other. In a state of wonder, I'm ready for God to change me. And when I wonder and search, I find new life. As one preacher says, not after the grain of wheat falls, but in the falling. Namely, the new life that's possible when I'm willing to let go. I wouldn't choose it, but I can see the blessings in the falling. And I'm grateful God has chosen us imperfect, broken people to do his work. God uses each of our gifts and makes them more. But you may ask, Bishop Curry, what about our church? Our church is in trouble. It's really struggling in this challenging time. And I would say, yes, that is true. But maybe what we see dying is the catalyst, the necessary catalyst for new fruit, for new life. So we'll be convinced that we have to change and that we have to trust and that we have to let go. We have good reason to believe that dying will create new community. In small and big ways, we're living in a season of letting go and we gotta move toward the light and some things are taking shape. Let's don't forget what we learned in COVID, that we know how to experiment. We know how to be creative. We can cast a wide net and communicate in all sorts of ways, and we need to. We learned that schedules are not sacred, but worship is. We look inside and outside the church walls a congregation that has decent music, warm leadership, good preaching, and engages something that the broader community really cares about will remain vital. Mostly we've learned to pray, always. We've learned our red doors are no longer magnetic. And sharing the gospel is urgent. It can't wait. It didn't wait with Jesus and it can't wait now. Look around where the people really are and take Jesus to them and allow the church to form around it. St. Paul says, our ministry is by God's mercy, so we do not lose heart, but the love of Christ urges us on. It is our fuel and where we start. Paul tells the Corinthians, because we believe that Jesus died for us, and therefore dying is accomplished through him, we're free to change and be different. We can live now for a higher purpose than ourselves. So we regard no one from a human point of view. I love that. Paul is saying the love of Jesus frees us from having to be God ourselves. The power to live out our vocation comes from God's hand. So we don't proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Christ and ourselves as servants for his sake. Yet in the very next verse, after our gospel reading in John, although Jesus, it says, although Jesus performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe him. We are so human. By that I mean fascinating, fragile, strong, weak, complicated, simple, talented, good, broken, flawed, all the mysterious mix of what human beings really are, amazingly selfish and self-absorbed, and at the same time, beautiful, wonderful, an unrepeatable miracle. 
Scripture tells us none of us is well suited, equipped, or prepared for what this vocation brings. But that doesn't stop God from asking us to follow. The mystery of the incarnation is this. In Christ, God becomes flesh also means he trusts flesh to carry out the message of the gospel. In spite of our fickle and fragile nature, God trusts us with each other's salvation, with each other's eternity. God decided in Jesus the only way to conquer evil was to let it be smothered within a willing, living human being, absorbed like blood in a sponge till it loses its power. We make love genuine. In Paul's language, we use all the ways you can to lose your life every day by making love tangible and visible and real, whether anyone notices or not, whether it makes you feel good about yourself or not, just waiting to see what each situation holds, doing your best to make it real, even if it costs you something. We're blessed with a defined way to lose our life one day at a time. Not everybody is. It's a gift. I pray you'll be blessed again with what someone told me is called the romance of the ministry. That is falling in love over and over with the strange, wonderful, and challenging people that God will send your way, each one a mystery ready to show me another way I can learn to love like Jesus. May God grant us the grace to lean into the challenge, the gift, and the pain of this life so that light will always shine in the darkness and the love of Christ will reign. I am foolish enough to believe the God who has begun a good work in us is faithful to bring it to pass. Amen.